It is a story that lends itself to fantasy, but it is indeed a reality. The story involves federal German investigators, international art smugglers, the mysterious Grand Master of the Knights Templar, a multi-millionaire known only as Moss, a car dealer, a gallery owner who daylighted as a police informant, and, most importantly, a horde of Nazi art. It sounds as if it ought to be a novel penned by Clive Custler, or alike, but it is far from fiction. The date is the 20th of May, 2015, and the time is 12 noon. It is an almost unified raid by police across multiple locations. These locations are in the states of the Federal Republic of Germany, that once called themselves West Germany. However, the hunt of the investigators will not run, or it cannot. So at 12 noon, the police begin their raid, a unified action. In Berlin offices from the Berlin State Office of Criminal Investigation raid 10 apartments and homes. In Kiel, a private home is raided, as well as one in Bad Dürkheim, in the Rhineland Palatinate. The final pieces that had led to this action came from a millionaire who did not exist, a Dutch art historian, and the ensnarement of an elusive Belgian art dealer operating out of Switzerland and Monaco. Soon investigators were seen carrying brown boxes from the raided homes, but with the swift action there also came a swift response. Buoyed by a sudden charge in atmosphere, journalists went in pursuit. Long lenses began to click onto camera bodies, step ladders were unfolded, photographs taken of subjects immobile. But it wasn't as if the police and investigators were restraining the subjects. It was rather that the subjects had never moved, at least never on their own. There had been rumors of hordes of statues cast by those favored amongst the Nazi elite for many years. These were statues thought to have been lost. If there had been searches for the National Socialist works, it was few at best. Many were simply presumed lost when the Soviet soldiers raided and burned homes and studios of the artists. Artists whose names were on Goebbels' Gottbegnadetenliste, the God Gifted list. The bombastic name for Goebbels' selection of artists, composers, architects, singers, and so on is reflected often of the work those on the list created. Upon the author's list was Ina Zeidel, who composed the poem Anthologie dem Führer, or Anthology to the Leader, as well as Nobel Prize winner Gerhard Hauptmann, who had been a founder of the German eugenics organization. Singers included the popular Wagnerian performer Josef Kreindl and Wilhelm Streintz. Then, upon the visual artist list, there was a collection of important names. The most prominent, Arno Brecker. Brecker was the thin-faced, pointed-nosed sculptor, a man who stood on Hitler's right as Hitler gazed on the Eiffel Tower and the most often approached for works embodying the National Socialist regime. But other than Brecker, there are also a few more important names. Fritz Klimsch, Georg Kolbe, and Josef Thorak. It is a piece, or rather pieces, of Josef Thorak's work that is most intriguing. As other pieces that the investigators found that day were saved from scrapyards or were simply purchased at the end of the war and hidden away, Thorak's work was quite different. And it was the attempted trade of these pieces that had spurned the German police and police departments into action. It was at a warehouse on Bruckstrasse in Bad Dürkheim the police, along with representatives from the Berlin State Office of Criminal Investigation, arrived. The warehouse on Bad Dürkheim's industrial estate is unassuming. A simple steel construction clad with corrugated metal. On the lower left side, there are windows that presumably would look into an office, but the shutters are drawn down. On the right, high over a single standard-sized doorway, there is a strip of security glass. And at the center of the pointed structure, a large roller metal door. Before it, a single street light stands. Seated at the end of the dead end road, there would be no reason for anyone to pass by. But if one were to wander this way, other than a bright yellow lorry trailer, there is nothing to catch the eye. But 
On the 20th of May 2015, the atmosphere is awash with a sense of excitement. A crowd of locals, even, has started to gather, awaiting to see what forgotten treasures await inside. If those outside were hoping for a scene similar to that one that ends Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, they were to be disappointed. When the door was opened, the first glance was of a metal rack held against the wall containing normal, everyday cardboard boxes. But when the investigators entered, they realized there was something inside that was certainly not normal. Behind a partition wall, hidden from view, there was a great shape. A blue plastic sheeting hung over something. The police approached. Cautiously, a few began lifting the edges of the plastic, covering up the mysterious structure. But quickly, as their eyes gazed down, they could see that they had indeed found a lost treasure. Beneath the plastic, they could see hooves, four pairs. Some glimmered a golden color, others looked more tarnished with age. Slowly and under careful observation, they drew the plastic away and revealed for all inside what was hidden beneath. Two great creatures now revealed beneath the dying light of the day that came through the high windows and the fluorescent tube light that shone a sickly yellow stood tall and strong. Two great horses, almost identical castings, their right hooves raised in the air by bent legs, mouths open, eyes wide, and muscles pronounced. There is no mistaking the period that these statues were born from, But what is amazing is that these horses were believed to be a gift. A gift from the sculptor Torak to, at the time of their casting, the most powerful man in Europe, Adolf Hitler. And they, the horses, were placed on a great pedestal that stretched along the garden frontage of the Albert Speer designed Neue Reichskanzleramt. Horses that hadn't been seen publicly since they disappeared from a Soviet army base in 1989. Join myself, Simon J. James, and Arctung History in The Hunt for Hitler's Horses and discover the not only bizarre but strange stories that surround Torax Bronze Works. Torak was more or less my sculptor, wrote Albert Speer in Spandau, The Secret Diaries, who, Torak, frequently designed statues and reliefs for my buildings. So where does the story begin? Well, the story begins in Vienna, the capital of the Austrian portion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in February 1889. Vienna had for centuries been important, but in 1889, work was nearing a major transformative period. The old walls had provided some form of defence had been dismantled, and in their stead a new wide road, the Ringstrasse, was constructed. Along this road, grand new buildings were constructed. Nearby dwellings, one or two-storey ramshackle buildings, were destroyed in favour of new five-storey neoclassical apartment blocks, all under the observant eye of the Emperor Franz Josef. Under Franz Josef, Austrian society was flourishing. Vienna was expanding rapidly and becoming the beating heart of not only the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but of Central Europe. It was into this world that, in February 1889, a boy, Josef Thorak, was born. But 1889 was a fateful year, for just ten weeks after his own birth, at the western end of the country, another baby was born. It was within the fate of the other child, Adolf, that Josef would find his own intertwined. He, Josef, was born to a potter from East Prussia who had relocated to Vienna. However, soon after Josef's birth, his mother relocated the family to her native Salzburg. It was here in his father's workshop that he first began to follow in the pottery trade spending the days watching and studying his father spin the clay on the wheel and mould from the earth fine figures as if his hands were Prometheus' own. Within Austria, during the time of Josef's formative years, 
there was a contrast in movements. The Vienna Succession, a movement closely associated with Jungenstil or Art Nouveau, had been formed in 1897. It was an artistic movement that brought energy and vitality as well as great artists, Hoffmann, Klimt, among others, to Vienna, that expanded their fame across Europe. Flowing decorative lines met with strong angular neoclassical facades, an idea of total art that contrasted the official Viennese Kunstlerhaus and its preservation of historicism. For the romanticism of the old and the incorporation of nationality into art, which the succession rejected. Salzburg was and remains a town that personifies historicism, a town still dominated over by its old castle and grandiose buildings that echoed from a much older period than the new delights of Vienna, and a town that thrived on its most famous son, Mozart. Not much is known of the early childhood years of Josef, but it was at some point during these years that a young Torak worked as a potter for the king Ferdinand of Bulgaria, making decorative pots and jewellery for the Bulgarian monarch. However, soon was returned once more to the framework of the cultural hub of Vienna. Josef found himself moving away from pottery and towards the line of art that would make him eventually famous sculpture. By 1910, Torek was enrolled at the Wiener Kunstakademy, the Viennese art school. Here he found himself amongst Josef Breitner, Josef Mullner, and Anton Hanak. There could be no confusion as to the line of art to which the academy belonged. Mullner would later create knights in iron, idealized statues of man, and Mozart memorials. Breitner would sculpt religious shrines and Hanak war memorials and national liberation motifs in Turkey. It was the quintessential historicism and nationalism embodiment. Under the tutelage of Dr. Julius von Schlosser, Torak was cultivated into historical source studies, the taking of literary texts that theoretically dealt with art. Schlosser began to shape, within this field, his student. But it was in the first year of the war that ravaged Europe that Josef made a decision. It was a decision to relocate from Vienna to Berlin. Schlosser agreed to facilitate the move and called upon a friend of his, the recently ennobled Wilhelm von Borda, director of the Kaiser Friedrich Museum that today bears his own name as the Borda Museum. Borda helped find the 25-year-old Torak accommodation and a placement with the great sculptor Manzel. Manzel, a friend of Kaiser Wilhelm II, had been selected to sculpt some of the statues that would honour the Kaiser's forefathers as kings and electors of Prussia and Brandenburg on the Ziegesalle, as well as many of the figures that adorn the German parliament building, the Reichstag. Under Manzel, there was a break from the clear-cut separation of the Viennese historicism and Jungenstil, and rather a movement towards a unity of the two. In the pottery workshops of Manzel, Thorak worked slaving away. In his spare time, he created decorative works, medals, tombs, monuments, and book covers in order to raise the funds to support his family. Often he would even create the decorative tiles for the kakelofen, or the tiled stove, that can still quite often be found in many Berlin apartments today. It was, however, in the sad years after the war had come to an end, that Torak began to carve his own destiny. The Great War had left German society broken and defeated. The glorious gilding of the pre-war years had been ended with death and destruction, only to be followed by plague and misery. Some artists found release from the torturous world in which they existed through the movement of German Expressionism, the delusionary narrative within an expressionist setting of Robert Wiener's famous film Das Cabinet des Dr. Caligari being a prime example. However, for others, such as Torak, they were part of a counterculture that embodied the national spirit in statues that wept with sorrow of the loss of the German war dead, but also the loss of Germany as a power. In 1922, Torek created the Sterbende Krieger, the Dying Warrior, that memorialized the dead of the Great War, and it was unveiled in Stolpmünde, today's Ustka, in Poland. Of it and this period, Von Borda wrote, 
Torak was able to pass through the years of the war, which most clearly expresses all the misery and corruption of the time in the so-called art of today, unscathed and uninfluenced. Yes, it was precisely in those sad times that he lent his full individuality. Even in the few war memorials commissioned with the help of friends, he created something new and tasteful as a sculptor, alone. In contrast to the countless monuments created out of love of the fatherland, but which were saddening in the long run, as with the gravestones with a simpler war symbol in the middle, find the hundred and more names of the fallen heroes, so tastefully arranged, applied or inscribed in beautifully drawn capitals, that the wonderful memories, and at the same time genuine works of art, are created. His work, the Sterbende Krieger in Stolpmünde, quickly made him famous and began to draw in the commissions. In studying nature, Torek began to produce fine art sketches and search for lighter subject matter that was difficult to find in a nation grieving. He found favour amongst those wishing to commission him in the field of clay and wax, returning towards the roots of his artistic training. He became adept at creating cores from clay and then decorating with wax figures using the natural colour of the wax to create soft colours. Torak also observed at this point in his work that the colour and consistency of the wax changed during different months depending on the flowers from which the bees had made their honey. In selling his work or gaining commissions, Torak raised the money he needed to build himself his own home. Commissioning architect Henry Rosenthal, a house was constructed that blended the styles not only of the time but of German history into a single home. Large Feldstein or field stones were placed at the base, buttresses supporting thick walls that led to small windows similar to a Bavarian mountain cabin. The roof was thatched, there was a large veranda beneath a cantilevered roof section that was semicircular, and it stood upon one of the few rises in the Brandenburg landscape, the Dundal Hill in Banzaro to Berlin's southeast. With the construction of the house came also the construction of Torak's first artist's studio. It was a place that was filled with light and allowed him to study his wax creations in greater detail, see how the light shone through the figures that stood on their own or how shadows and definition were created in friezes. It was his friezes and statues that captured the city of Berlin's government. In 1928, the city purchased a statue of the naked woman named Die Fromme, or the Pious, a wax statue of a woman rising out of a base, her head tilted up as if smelling fresh air for the first time, her hands showing, their palms pushing forward as if about to rise from water, as well as purchasing the large waxen group entitled Seinfucht, or Longing. The lines of his statue were smooth and natural, soft and pleasant and appealing to the eye, and they certainly caught the eyes of the powers that be. Also in 1928, Torek found himself admitted to the prestigious Prussian Academy of Arts, which granted subsidies to artists and helped fund studios, and he also found himself with a very different commission. On Berlin's busy intersection of Potsdamer Platz, the crossroads of Europe, there stood the entertainment building of Berlin, Haus Vaterland. Haus Vaterland, constructed between 1911 and 1912 as the Haus Potsdam, before being renamed patriotically in 1914 as Haus Vaterland, was going through a redesign. It had been bought by the bank for Handel and Grundbesitz and leased the Kempinski family on a 10-year run to try and bring the old building back to its glory days, after the difficult beginnings of the 1920s had led the old business almost to ruin. Part of this was changing the spaces within, modernizing them for the times and creating spaces that captured the glory of Berlin in those decadent years of the late 1920s. The largest room, not including the cinema, was the Parlementsaal that stretched from the fourth floor into the fifth and finally beneath the great dome that crowned the building. Professor Ernst Stern designed the space and Josef Torak was commissioned to design the decorative elements. Opening in 1929, those who entered were welcomed to a glittering spectacle. On the parquet floor, girls danced in choreographed performances or men and women came together in the evenings to dance the night away to the live band that performed upon the stage. They danced into the early hours beneath gilded palms that stretched into the dome and hung overhead. Bunches of figs provided for embellishments to the mirrors and bronze railings. Those not dancing drank at the tables near recesses where bowls of fruit cast from molds created by Torek's hand, where a Bacchus could happily fall into fruitful lust. 
The financial crisis that began in 1929 and continued for some time dampened the moods, and much of the dancing beneath Tuareg's grove of bronzed greenery quickly taped out, as did commissions within Germany for Tuareg's work. It could only be saddening to reach the brink of artistic success, to have climbed to the table where the old masters feasted only to have the rug drawn from beneath their feet. In Germany, there was no money to be spent on the arts at this time. Factories closed their doors, unemployment grew, and the wealthy upper middle class in the city who had financed much of Torek's work and studies ceased to arrive. There was, however, some work for Torek. Turkey had been through a national movement that had led to a single-party state under Mustafa Kemal. Kemal, who had led the nationalist movements and now headed the government, was granted the title Ataturk, or Father of the Turks and was keen to modernize the new state, but also cement power and memorialize the national victory and the birth of Turkey as a state. Not as affected by the Great Depression, and with the wealth of a nation at hand, Ataturk began acquiring the services of foreign artists to capture the struggle of the nation in new art that would be monumental in size. Prior to the commission, Torek's largest works had been the statues of grief for the dead of the Great War, now, however, his work was exploding in size and monumentalism and nationalism were becoming one as an artistic movement that shored up an ideology of state. The experience Torek gained in Turkey would be key to success in Germany. In Germany, as the foundation blocks of a Turkish national liberation memorial designed by Torek were being laid in Turkey, Adolf Hitler had risen to and was now consolidating power. Where the 1920s had been a liberation in art for many artists and movements within Germany, from Expressionism to Dadaism, the 1930s with the NSDAP of Hitler and his propaganda minister Goebbels were to be very different. In art that was approved by the new regime, there was to be a new nationalistic geist, new embodiments of the national spirit and a new discourse around the history of Germany in art. Gone were the jagged edges of the Expressionist styles, the flat roofs or clean lines of modernism, and returned with the knights of the Teutons, the Nibelungen, and the great characters of Mythos, Friedrich Barbarossa and Siegfried, amongst others. If this new direction was not enough, it all, of course, had to be appeasing to the whims of the megalomaniac who believed only in bigger is better. Therefore, Torek fell before the knees of the Nazi regime and its ideology, and put himself forward as an artist to realize the dreams of the dictator. Thorak really did throw his entire energy behind the regime in the hope of becoming one of its principal artists. So devote was he to the new cause and its ideologies, he divorced his second wife, Hilda, because she was Jewish. Thorak, however, allowed her to remain at the home until she was forced to emigrate a year later, after which little trace of her is found. In 1934, he had cemented himself within the regime as a key artist. Proof of this exists in the German Historical Museum in Berlin today. A great bronze face, tired and old, its eyes closed in eternal sleep, the death mask of Paul von Hindenburg, the German president and man who had helped pave the way to power for Adolf Hitler. It was Torak who was selected to create this death mask. Torak was in favor but he was also becoming devoted to the National Socialist cause. The Führer Prinzip and also the Gleichschalt tongue of power within Adolf Hitler. Just two weeks after the death of Paul von Hindenburg, Joseph Goebbels, Reich Minister for Propaganda and Enlightenment, published a manifesto in the Nazi Volkischer Beobacht newspaper, which read, Call of the Creative Artist, Berlin, 17th August. The undersigned personalities make the following appeal to the public. Comrades, friends. We have buried one of the greats of German history. At his coffin, the young leader of the Reich spoke for all of us and made a confession for himself and the nation's will for the future. He gave his word and life as a pledge for the rebuilding of our people who want to live in unity and honour and be guarantors of the peace that unites the nations. We believe in this leader who has fulfilled our fervent desire for unity. We trust in his work, which demands devotion beyond all criticizing reason. 
We place our hope in the man who believes in God's providence beyond man and things. Because the poet and artist can only create in equal loyalty to the people, and because he proclaims the same and deepest conviction that the most sacred right of peoples is to determine their own destiny, we belong to the Führer's followers. We demand nothing for ourselves but what we grant other peoples without reservation. We must demand it for this people, the German people, because its unity, freedom and honor is the need and will of us all. The Führer has once again urged us to stand by him in trust and loyalty. None of us will be missing when it comes to expressing this. It was followed by the signatures of 37 artists of the new German Reich. A signature upon this paper lay support for Hitler merging the office of Chancellor with that of President. It also lay support for the regime and would help secure the artist's path within the totalitarian state. The signatures included Emil Fahrenkamp, who designed the Shell House in Berlin, the composer Wilhelm Furtwängler, the art historian Ebert Hamstingl, architect of the 1936 Olympic Stadium Walter March, world-famous architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, and naturally, Josef Torak. Torak's signature began to work wonders for him. In 1935, he was awarded his own exhibit. This exhibit was quickly followed by another arranged by the National Socialist chief ideologist and one of the leaders of anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany, Alfred Rosenberg. It was also around this time that Josef Torak came into contact with a young hotshot architect, Albert Speer. Since 1934, Speer had become Hitler's architect. When entrusted in 1934 with the Zeppelin Tribune, Albert Speer had become the architect not only of Hitler, but of National Socialism. Therefore, it was Speer who was entrusted with the representing this new Germany on the world stage come the exhibition in Paris in 1937. The German pavilion at the fair was monolithic, a great structure of concrete that rose high to be crowned with a great golden eagle, a swastika within a reef, clasped within its claws. The structure itself was then clad in high-quality stone. But at the base, Speer had created the space for two monumental statues to be placed, and Torak, enjoying the trust of the regime, was the man selected to occupy the space with his works. To the left, above the letters that spelt out Deutschland, rose three overtly muscular figures. Gone were the smooth forms of Torex past, the soft subtleties of wax replaced in favour of cold bronze, the figures two men and a woman, the men looking to the horizon, stark naked, their right hands clasped together, their muscles built upon muscles. Behind the woman rises over their shoulders and looks up towards the sky, or rather towards the hammer and sickle of the Soviet pavilion opposite. On the other side of the entrance above the French for Germany, Alemania, a similar three figures. This time it's two females and one man, their hands rather than clasps, hang at their sides. Representing together security, pride, self-consciousness, purity and discipline, they represent the new Germany. It was triumphal, monumental. Gazers looking forth to a new fascist future beneath the Hackenkreuz and opposing the hammer and sickle. In the same year that the new National Socialist Germany was proclaiming itself and its ideologies abroad, they were also swirling their artistic propaganda at home. In 1937, the first monumental structure of the National Socialist regime opened, designed by Paul Trust, the Haus der Deutschen Kunst, opened three years after the architect's death. It rose high in a stripped neoclassicism and stretched long behind columns. Opening on the 18th of July, 1937, with celebrations that included a military parade and the square before the building decked in hundreds of red flags bearing the white circle encapsulated swastika, Hitler makes a speech. Entering the building, he is joined by many of the Nazi elite, including Goering and soon is passing by works of art by those artists considered great by the Nazi regime. In the background stands a copy of Torak's work, from the German pavilion in Paris. A close-up shot of the death mask of Hindenburg follows. Meanwhile, as the show of German art was continuing in Munich, Torek himself was relocating to the Bavarian capital. 
Hitler had become a great fan of the artist and had chosen Torek to indoctrinate young artists into the monumental style of the regime, which Torek now characterized so well. Offered the position of head of a masterclass at the Akademie der Bildenden Künste München, Torek accepted. He was gifted a studio space in the Kunstpavilion München, a small building located within the old botanical gardens. It was only recently opened, having been constructed by Oswald Bieber the previous year, on the location where Munich's Glaspalast had once stood before a fire destroyed it in 1931. Here, in this small mausoleum-like building beneath a hung ceiling of glass, Torak set to work on a trio of new sculptures. However, the following year of 1938 almost spelt disaster for Torak. Whilst waiting for his meal of trout to arrive before him in the Osteria Bavaria, on Schellingstrasse in Munich, the Gauleiter of Bavaria, Adolf Wagner, began to recant a tale. Hitler and Albert Speer listened. Wagner, a strong-faced and broad man, recanted that it had come to his attention that a document, a communist proclamation, had been discovered. Upon this proclamation, that was dated prior to the seizure of power by the National Socialist regime, were numerous signatures of artists one of which being Josef Torax. Albert Speer had been commissioning Torax for many works, and indeed even financing him as well. As Torax's Munich lifestyle became more and more lavish, indeed Torax even once wrote to Speer requesting more money, to which Speer replied, What use is half a Friedrich, half a Prince Eugen, and large figures who stand on one leg? So I prefer to send what he, the master, needs, and be it hard cash, so I quickly sent the check to poor Torak. But with this mention of the connection between Torak and a communist proclamation, Speer stiffened. Could all of his designs and investments come to naught if Torak were arrested by the Gestapo? Indeed, he could even be incarcerated or shot as many communist supporters had been after the burning of the Reichstag. Speer thought Torak lost, but Hitler quite simply, but disdainfully replied as he sat at his favourite seating within the Osteria Bavaria. Oh, you know, I don't take any of that seriously. We should never judge artists by their political views. The imagination they need for their work deprives them the ability to think in realistic terms. Let's keep Torak on. Artists are simple hard souls. Today they sign this, tomorrow that. And they don't even look to see what it is, so long as it seems to them well-meaning. Ironic, considering not only that Torak had signed the call of created artists that supported Hitler's merging, of the offices of Chancellor and President, but also because Hitler himself had once tried to become an artist. Torak, therefore, was given a reprieve. Torak had always loved nature. His home in Bad Zaro, that he had left to relocate to Munich, reflected this. Set atop of the hill, it was an isolation in nature. The atelier or studio that he occupied now in Munich was, despite being in the midst of a large city, slowly becoming lost among saplings that were blooming into trees. Animals were important to him. Later, Karl Lothmer Tanks in Deutsche Plastik unserer Zeit would write, Torak loves the creature. Dogs run around in the studio, deer in the park, horses in the stable. It was the horses that bear most interest at this time. Slowly, Torak, spending much money received from the state for his work, whittled away at clay to form from the fine earth creatures, majestic and strong. A trio of horses caught in motion as if on military parade. From the clay moulds were created in turn, bronze was cast into the void, and there emerged before him three majestic creatures. It was decided that the first was to go on display in the 1939 season of art at the Haus der Deutschen Kunst for the third Grosser Deutsch Kunstausstellung. In March of 1939, Torak would put his artistic tools to rest, if just for a few weeks. He was growing increasingly close to the circle of artists that surrounded the core of the Nazi ideology. Chief among them, the architect would replace Trust as favorite to Hitler, Albert Speer, and Albert Speer remembers. In March 1939, I took a trip with a group of close friends through Sicily and southern Italy. Wilhelm Kreis, Josef Torak, Hermann Kaspar, Arno Becker, Robert Frank, Karl Brandt, and their wives formed the party. Magda Goebbels, the propaganda minister's wife, came along at our invitation. She used a false name for the journey. Sicily, with its Doric temple ruins in Sigasta, Syracuse, Salinas, and Arigentum, 
provided a valuable supplement to the impressions of our earlier journey to Greece. At the sight of the temples of Salinas and Arigentum, I observed once again, and with some satisfaction, that even classical antiquity had not been free of megalomaniacal impulses. The Greeks of the colonies were obviously departing from the principle of moderation so praised in the motherland. Compared to these temples, all the examples of Saracen Norman architecture we encountered paled, except for Friedrich II's wonderful hunting castle, the octagonal Castel del Monte. Pastum was another high point of our trip. Pompeii, on the other hand, seemed to me further away from the pure forms of Pastum than were our buildings from the world of the Dorians. Speer, at this point, was deep in the construction of his monumental Neue Reichskanzlei in Berlin, a building of epic proportions designed for Hitler as the new headquarters of the Greater German Reich. Decorated with rich Italian marble as well as art from Arno Brecker, who accompanied Speer and Torak on the tour. 1939 wasn't any year for the Haus der Deutschen Kunst. Munich had been awash with people from across the German Reich celebrating a theatrical history of Germany. Men were dressed in gilded suits of armor astride horses. Women were dressed in traditional costumes. The streets were lined with girls in black neckerchiefs from the Bund Deutsche Mädel, boys in their Hitler youth uniforms, all cheered and waved little flags that had been handed out. It was the third opening exhibition of the Große Deutsche Kunstausstellung and the last that Hitler would personally attend. Torek's horse, now entitled Schreiten der Pferd, or simply Walking Horse, took pride of place. Replacing the copy of Torek's Paris German pavilion work, it became admired greatly, most notably by the Führer as he quickly toured, laughing with the generals who flanked his side. There was a distinctly military flavor to this opening, where the first exhibition had seen Hitler flanked by those who represented aspects of the party. This, the third, was quite the opposite. It was July 1939, and by this point, Hitler's troops had marched into Austria with the Anschluss and the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, with the rest of the Czech lands quickly followed. But the artistic and building aspirations of Hitler were not to be put on hold, even if war was looming. Speer was ordered to keep designing, and that the models of his new city of Germania that Hitler often admired in the evening were still to take precedence for materials. A note had arrived with Thorak that Hitler had admired his artistic horse greatly. It was so very different from the early work which had warmth and soft naturalism. Now it was bold and quite cold, but being admired by Hitler led Torak to conspire with Speer on a gift. The two other horses had not yet a home. Speer's chancellery had been finished structurally in January of that year, or at least so it was proclaimed. The truth, in fact, was that, like much of Nazi Germany, it was a veneer and work still continued on. However, whilst the structure had been finalized, its designs, the decorations, rather, had not. Whilst Brecker had been granted the commission for two monumental statues of men, one brandishing a torch representing party, the other a sword representing the Wehrmacht to decorate the honor courtyard, the terrace that the Führer's working room looked out onto had not been decorated. It was therefore decided that this would be the perfect placement for the two horses that still filled Torek's atelier. Torak's atelier was certainly growing too small, especially considering a grateful Führer wished for more commissions to be given to an artist, who certainly ranked amongst his favorites. Hitler had great plans for Torak, wishing for him to create the grand embodiment of victory, winged to be triumphantly placed on the march fields at the Nuremberg Party rally grounds. The main figure, planned to be over 17 meters in height, certainly could not have been created in the tiny atelier in Munich. Therefore, distracting Speer from his plans in Germania, Hitler commissioned him to create for Torak a new studio. The site was chosen in the suburban town of Baldham to Munich's east. Here, Speer would build for Torak his new studio that naturally fell into the monumental design. The central structure was 18 meters tall in order for the winged victory to be created. Great doors were installed so that the megalithic structures could be removed from the 700 meter squared space. The whole area was completed by 1941, the year that finally Josef Torak applied 
for membership to the NSDAP and was personally accepted into the party by Hitler. There seemed little to stop the progress of Torak within the corrupt Nazi regime. He grew richer and richer from his work, with tens of statues and sculptures being on display at the Grosse Deutsche Kunstausstellung and purchased by numerous different Nazi officials. Hitler personally bought five. Goebbels, Bormann, Ley and Speer also purchased Torek's work. Robert Ley, the drunk who showed the former King Edward around Germany in 1937, purchased Pieter for 100,000 Reichsmarks in 1942. Speer followed in paying the most for any piece exhibited at the Grosse Deutsche Kunstausstellung, with 200,000 for Torek's Francesca de Rimini. Torak was considered indispensable by the state. To this end, in 1944, he was placed on the Gottbegnadeten Liste, or the God Gifted List. Being placed upon this list meant that Torak, unlike many older men of Germany, did not have to go to war, a war that was forever getting closer. It was by 1944 that many of the Nazi elite began to internally feel that Germany could not win, since Stalingrad and the failure to take Moscow due to the horrid Russian winters Germany had been on the back foot. The Soviet advances, coupled with the intense air raids by the Western Allies, which we have covered before somewhat in the Nazi in the Moon series, brought a few of those of the elite to take some action. Speer was one. The city of Berlin was being increasingly attacked, and soon Speer's mind turned towards protecting some of the art that had been installed within the city by his hand, principally the work of Torak and Brecker. The statues were loaded onto trucks that could bear their weight, and they were driven from the city. As ever, the Nazi German state was a state of parallels and hypocrisy. Whilst many within the country who whispered of impending doom would find themselves charged with defeatism and find themselves in concentration camps if they were lucky, those at the head of the state followed an entirely different set of rules. Whilst people starved, Goering gorged. When Goebbels ranted and raved, the victory was at hand, the Soviets broke the stalemate and the Allies began to lay waste to the German cities. A Speer saved statues, those enslaved by his hand, perished. The statues were taken from the city to the house of another Speer's artistic friends, Arno Brecker, at the Rittergut Jakobsbruck near Ritzen. Arno Brecker had received the Gutz house as a 40th birthday present from Adolf Hitler in 1940. It was a small, typical Brandenburg Gutz house, principally one story built over a cellar to protect from the damp that was always a threat on the Orderbruch, and decorated in simplistic Baroque ornamentation. But it had grounds, and soon these grounds were to find themselves occupied by many of the works that not only Speer admired, but with works of Torek purchased by Robert Ley finding themselves also jutting from the provincial Brandenburg landscape. Over the course of the next months, the Red Army advanced to the Soviet Union accelerated greatly. By the end of 1944, the borders that the Greater German Reich occupied now resembled their position before Operation Barbarossa had begun in June 1941. In 1945, the Oder River and its surrounding countryside, the Oderbruch and Zelo Heights, presented the final natural barrier before Berlin. But on the 16th of April, the Battle of Berlin began in earnest, when the forces of the Soviet Union with their newly liberated allies, the Poles, crossed the Oder and began their advance. Fritzen, where Brecker had his home, fell on the first day. There a strange sight awaited the Soviet forces. Opposing ideology, but similar in style, there awaited a graveyard of statues similar to those that littered the Eastern Bloc after the fall of the Soviet Union. Works that National Socialist elite had spent hundreds of thousands of Reichsmarks on now scattered amongst the trees and woods that surrounded Arno Brecker's home. Thrilled with their advance, the Russians began to celebrate. Magazines of bullets were offloaded at the immobile sculptures as if the soldiers were attacking the mythical figures of which they bore artistic resemblance. Fires were lit around their bases, glass bottles placed within their hands. Soon the once tranquil gardens became an area of devastation. The German art historian Kurt Reuty and founder of the Central Office for the Collection and Care of Works of Art that hoped to salvage Berlin's culture from the ruins of war visited Weizsäcker and wrote. The Russians had torched everything that would burn. There were six larger than life sized bronzes laying outside the studio, along with the five by three and a half meter bronze relief, the Comraden. 
and a destroyed marble relief, almost as large, titled Daphne and Apollo. Two Breca sculptures from the Reich Chancery were lying on the ground in a nearby field. Then, later in the year, an official by the name of Damarov writes a memo about the grounds. There are, within the grounds, two bronze sculptures. One, a seated woman larger than life, is by Professor Klimsch. And nearby, there are also two larger than life-size bronze horses. These, these are the Hitler horses by Torak. And for many, many years, this simple note on official brown off-colored paper was the last record of the pair of horses that once graced the terrace of Hitler's Reich Chancellery. In the second and concluding part of the hunt for Hitler's horses, discover the strange and incredible tale of the horses' discovery. Shady art dealers, art investigators, multimillionaires, and the illicit trade of Nazi artifacts, all on Arctung History. Thank you for listening to Arctung History. Presented by myself, Simon J. James, and produced by TheBerlinTourGuide.com. This week, the hunt for Hitler's horses. Support Arctung History on Patreon and gain early access to the concluding part, as well as episode insights to previous episodes, all from just one euro. Be the first to know about Arctung History updates by following on Instagram and Twitter at Arctung History or on Facebook at Arctung History Podcast.